sentences uh, to yeah. your audio real quick. Okay. I'm talking now. How's it going? This is testing. Welcome to the class. Is it okay? Hello. How are you? Yeah, it's working? Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Then I'm going to get started. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. How are you? How is this light? A little bit dark? Shall I do a little more? Is that better? Talk to me? Yeah. This is good. Okay. How is this sound? Good. You, if you need more sound, let me know, okay? Because I have the opportunity to do that. I'm taping this. Uh, it's going to be on RAM CT, so you can also look this back. So if uh, you didn't catch anything, you can always look it back. And this will also be for distance um, offering in the fall, so it has dual purpose. Okay, welcome everyone. This is BZ440, Plant Physiology. And uh, my name is Elizabeth pilon smith I'm also called Leanne. You can call me Elizabeth or Leanne, either way. Um, I'm in the biology department. Uh, I'm a professor there, um, and I work on plant uh, physiology, uh, on uh, environmental cleanup using plants and also selenium hyperaccumulator plants. I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a minute. My office is in this building on the, in the east wing, room E416, I think B actually, I'm in the back of the lab. And my phone number is 491-4991, area code 970. And uh, my email is epsmiths at Lamar. So feel free to contact me if you want to talk to me. You can also drop by. If you want to be sure I'm there, then you can make an appointment by email. I don't really have office hours, but I'm, I'm uh, available whenever you need me. So don't be shy. Um, let's see, that's all about this. Um, I would like to hear more about all you guys, uh, but I want to start with uh, telling a little bit about myself. Uh, you've heard from my accent, which never goes away, that I'm not from America, but I'm from Europe. Uh, from a very small country called Holland or the Netherlands. Here you see it in yellow. It's about the size of New Jersey. And there are 17 million people living there. It's very flat. And in fact, half the country is under sea level. And so uh, there are lots of dikes uh, and lots of water. And uh, you can get around by boat. Half, uh, so th uh, all the water is continuously pumped out. That's why they have all these windmills, which you may have heard of or seen. Nowadays, they do it electrically, and so uh, it's a struggle to keep the, the sea out. People used to wear lots of wooden shoes, not a cliche, and uh, grow a lot of tulips. <laughs> so if you buy tulips or other bulbs here, they're probably from the Netherlands. Uh, this is the city where I went to university, Utrecht. It was founded by the Romans around the year zero as Altraectum. It was on the River Rhine, which was the edge of the Roman Empire. And um, it's been there ever since. It's a very nice city. Uh, it's the biggest university in the country. It used to have 30,000 students. I don't know exactly what they have now. And it has some nice canals, lots of nice places to eat along the canal. Um, and so I studied biology there. And um, I, 1987, I got my master's degree there in uh, biology, uh, and I did a PhD there between 1987 and 1992. I worked on CAM, which is Cresolation Acid Metabolism. It's a kind of special kind of physiology that is a drought resistance uh, adaptation in the Cresolaceae family. So I studied the evolution of this pathway in this family. And then I continued and did a postdoc uh, two years of postdoc research at the same university in a different department, um, molecular cell biology, where I uh, studied transgenic plants that produce bacterial sugars called fractans, and I studied it in the context of drought resistance. Then I went to Berkeley in 1994, nice city by the bay, San Francisco, and I worked on two projects. One was, again, transgenic plants that produce um, sugar, special kinds of sugars, uh, trehalose and fractans again. I worked with tobacco and with sugar beet. And then I also started a new project, which was in the main interest of the lab where I was, which was Norman Terry's lab, on selenium uh, 
plant selenium physiology in the context of phytoremediation because selenium is an environmental contaminant and they wanted to use plants to clean it up. So I actually still work on that topic, so it really um, captured my interest. I came to, um, thank you, um, I came to CSU in 1998, so I've been here 16 and a half years, and um, I, my research focuses on plants that, um, what plants can do with selenium, so how, how do they take it up, how do they tolerate it, uh, what do they do with it? Uh, how do they metabolize it into which different forms? How can we manipulate that? So I used genetic engineering to create plants that were more tolerant or accumulated more selenium or accumulated different forms of selenium. Um, and then I also got interested in certain plants that are native here in Colorado and they hyper accumulate selenium up to one and a half percent of their dry weight. And you can see them right here in the foothills as you walk around Pine Ridge, for instance, or Coyote Ridge. Um, or Kathy Prom Prairie, they're beautiful, uh, they're Princess Plume um, milk veg, um, and they, they, we, we were interested in why do they hyperaccumulate, how do they hyperaccumulate, and we found that it protects them from herbivores and pathogens, so it has ecological functions, and, um, and how they accumulate it, we're doing molecular work to study what their secrets are, how they can tolerate and accumulate such high levels, so that is the interest of the work in my lab. And I hope to hear more about you guys' uh, interest. And maybe you can give me a flavor of, um, of your major. So who is a uh, horticulture major here? So it's quite a lot of people, maybe a quarter or 20%. How about soil and crop science? About the same, about 15% maybe. H how about biology majors? Okay, so that's maybe 10% of the people. Um, then there is uh, rangeland ecology, forestry, Okay, also about maybe 10%. Who did I miss? Wildlife. Okay, wildlife, yeah. Okay, environmental science. So we have a diverse audience here, and uh, you have different goals for what to do uh, with your life, and hopefully uh, you want to do some good. And what you have in common is uh, that you probably are going to be interested in studying plants, growing them yourself. Um, or studying them as they grow in nature and trying to either make them do what you want or optimize, let nature uh, optimally uh, do its thing. So that's where, where this course comes in. Uh, we're going to have a look at how these plants function, how, how do they acquire the nutrients, how do they deal with water, um, which nutrients do they need, um, how do they shuttle them about in their, uh, in their tissues, how do they grow and develop, how do they respond to their environments where either light um, or um, CO2 or um, if there's stress, if they're attacked, uh, abiotic, biotic stresses, how do they respond to them? What are mechanisms? So if we know how plants work, we can make them work better or we can um, just monitor them well and hopefully uh, uh, make things uh, go as they should. Uh, there's, so we're going to have a look at all these aspects of plant physiology. Uh, we also have at the end a topic on biotechnology, um, which is an approach that is used to study plants, but also it's used to manipulate plants, to make plants do things that no other plant can, by maybe putting in a bacterial gene or something. So we're going to have a look at that as an example of approaches that can be used uh, in plant physiology. And we're also, as we go along, uh, will encounter other approaches that people use to study plants. So hopefully you'll learn something about how you study plants. How do people find out these things? So I'll, I'll mention this as we go along. So that is the, those are our topics that we're going to lo look at. And what you see on the right here, one, two, three, those are three sections uh, roughly uh, into which this course is divided. And each of these sections will end with an exam. So there will be two midterm exams and then there will be a final exam. And these midterms constitute 30% of your grade, and the final exam is 40% of the grade. And all the exams are multiple choice. There will be 40 questions on the midterms and 80 questions on the final. And on the final, we will have repeat questions from the two midterms, which is half of the final, and then 40 new questions. And those repeat questions may be tweaked a little bit, but basically, if you know very well all the questions from the midterms you have, you come in with a head start on the final. The final is comprehensive, but it, that can actually work in your favor. 
Any questions about the structure of the course? Okay. There is a course website. Um, on the website you will find the syllabus, maybe you already did. And it has the same information on here. It also uh, shows how each of these sections is divided into modules. Uh, the first and second module have six uh, sections, have six modules each, and the third has four modules. The module is kind of a topic. Uh, it corresponds roughly with a chapter or a topic in the book. The book is uh, from Tate and Zeiger, and it's the fifth edition or the sixth edition. And you don't have to buy it. And if you have another plan for this book, that's fine too. So you don't have to buy anything. It, um, it can help you learn more, though, if you buy it. So I wouldn't say don't buy it. But it's 750 pages of good stuff. So uh, feel free to buy it. And it may give you an edge and get a little bit better grade. But even if you don't have the book, you should be able to get an A. All the pictures I show, all the figures, they are from the Tetz and Zeiger book, almost all of them. So you can always go back to the book and look them up and look in more detail. So the exams are, uh, or the midterms are on Fridays, the Friday of week six and the Friday of week 12. Uh, the dates, um, I guess, will be clear. And we'll get back to them also. I usually do a review session on the Wednesday before the exam, so then you can ask questions. I will go over some, some main things. We'll do some drawing. So it's just some recap. So you will know when the exam is coming up. I think that's about all about organization. So there's a, a RAMCT or, um, yeah, I'm using RAMCT. Uh, websites for this course where you can see all the presentations, you can see practice exams. Uh, also, these lectures are going to be on there, so you can see them again. Uh, the, the grades will be on there. And you can also post things, and I will post things, so that's an opportunity to communicate. You can email via the website, too. If you want to set up study groups or something, that's something you could maybe organize. The book itself also has a website that you can check out. If you have the book, you can log in, and then you can uh, see what else they have on there. They have some videos, some problems. I don't go into what's on here, so you could study that by yourself if you like. OK, uh, any new questions that meanwhile popped up? No? OK. So um, plant physiology, how do they work? How do they feed themselves? How do they respond to their environment? And um, how are these things regulated? So you'll see how plants can um, respond to, uh, if the conditions get too dry, what do they do? Or if they get deficient in a certain nutrient, how can they respond to that? Um, then they, they capture CO2 from the air. How can they, how can they uh, respond to uh, when there's light, for instance, they need light to fix CO2, they respond to that. Or um, the photosynthesis, the making sugars is also regulated at the biochemical level. So we're going to have a look at, at these various ways of plant regulations and then responses to adverse conditions. If a, pl if a plant is attacked, uh, then we're going to have a look at all these. Um, you see that, I'll use the mouse. So here, a plant is attacked by a caterpillar, for instance. And what they can do is they can upregulate defenses, kind of like an immune response, where they make toxic compounds in response, or they may emit volatiles that attract predators of the attacker. So there are all kinds of interesting uh, biochemical uh, warfare um, things going on with plants. Plants can warn each other also by emitting volatiles, and then the neighbor will start to upregulate its defenses when one is attacked. So there's all these interesting things going on with plants. Plants look like very sitting ducks, but they are ac very actively sensing and responding to their environment and communicating. So hopefully you'll get an appreciation for this in the course. So uh, why do we study plant physiology? Because we're curious. That's hopefully an incentive that everybody has. Little kids are already asking all kinds of things about the world around them. 
So uh, out of curiosity, we, all kinds of questions probably pop up into your head. And you may follow up on that by phrasing a hypothesis and doing an experiment and then hopefully getting an answer or maybe getting a partial answer and designing a next experiment. And that's what scientists do all the, all the time. So they hope to learn new things. And then the things that you find can sometimes be applied. And sometimes it can be totally uh, unexpected. You can find things that can be applied that you never looked for or maybe you very purposefully looked for something with the aim to apply it. But plant biology can be uh, very applicable. If you think of the world population, we're growing, we need to feed everybody. And plant biology is essential for keeping the world fed. And that's especially challenging if conditions change, like um, maybe our land is getting um, more polluted or um, the sea levels are rising, land may, amount of arable land may go down also because the world population needs more land. Uh, we have rising CO2 levels that's going to affect plant performance all around. So uh, we have all these challenges and plant biologists have to try to keep up kind of with the challenging condi changing conditions in the growing world population. And policy makers need plant physiologists to inform them also. So some of you may become policy makers yourself and then your plant biology background will help you make good decisions. So that's, those are all possible um, jobs where you may end up and you may work as a researcher in a government institution or a, at a university or you may make policy and uh, make decisions that affect lots of people. So it can be applied uh, in many ways. Uh, you can use plants to feed people but also to clothe people and you can make plastics or, or other building materials with plants, um, oils for all kinds of purposes. Plants are so applicable for many things. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we're going to have a look at plant biotechnology as one approach to study plants, but also we can use whole plant physiological experiments where we, uh, we give plants a certain treatment, see what they do, like how, might, how well do they grow, or how do they look, oh, they suddenly look yellow, or uh, they turn necrotic, or hey, um, they have different shapes, they, they have morphology changes. You can just give plants different treatments and see how they uh, res respond. Sometimes you can also split roots and give half of the roots some treatments and the other half not and then see um, if the whole plant responds even though only half of the roots are treated. That can tell you something about long distance communication between the roots and the shoots. So there are just, just different approaches that plants, um, that people can use and hopefully you'll pick those up as we go along. At the end, I'll do a quick review of remember this is what you could do if you have this kind of question. This approach you can use if you have that kind of question. So that's a little bit of a flavor of what we're going to do and, and now the next thing is we're going to actually start with the first topic. Does anybody want to add anything at this point? Okay. So the first topic, first module is going to be about plant and cell anatomy. And um, this is a 400 level course, so most of you probably had much of this before in introductory biology courses. Well, what is a cell made up of? Uh, what is the anatomy of a plant? So uh, we're going to recap this a little bit. So a plant typically has a shoot and a root, so it's partly above uh, ground, partly below ground. But of course, some plants are aquatic, they're in the water. Um, but uh, basically shoot and a root, and then the root, the shoot has a stem often and leaves, not always a stem. Not always big leaves, so there's variation, but that's the basic anatomy of a plant. And then there is, um, usually there are flowers on plants as they reach maturity and the, the flowers will make seeds. So that's the reproductive part of the plant. So you have the roots, the shoots, the reproductive uh, system. And if you look within these different organs at the cell level or at the tissue level, you see that each of these organs has a layer that surrounds it and then it has ground tissue that kind of fills the organ and there's vascular tissue which is for um, transport of molecules in water, which are molecules too, uh, between the different plant parts. So those are the, the tissues, the basic tissues that you find in all these plant parts. So we're going to have a little better look later in this module at these uh, different tissue types. Uh, zooming out, uh, where are plants in the big scheme of things? Uh, this is a tree of life. Life started um, with unicellular organisms, one cell with very simple structure, just one compartment with lots of molecules in it. Those are the prokaryotes. 
they don't have compartmentalized cells, and then at some point um, the eukaryotes evolved, probably by several prokaryotes kind of eating each other, and the one who was eaten convinced the one who ate it that they should keep him alive and start uh, using him as uh, what's now called an organelle. So um, these eukaryotes have different compartments, uh, and these compartments have different functions, and some of them may have been free living organisms themselves in the past. So within these eukaryotes with compartmentalized cells, we have the unicellular uh, ones, which are the protists, and then we have the multicellular ones. Um, and within the multicellular ones, we have plants, fungi, and animals. And fungi have traditionally been considered uh, as part of botany, so part of studying plants. But if you look at this evolutionary tree, you see that fungi are actually more related to animals. If you're interested in fungi, then there's another course, Mycology, where you learn all about fungi. We're not going to do, uh, we're gonna, not going to include fungi here. Within, we're going to look at plants, and within plants, we're going to focus on the higher plants. If you look here at uh, plant kingdom, we have uh, original uh, algae. Some of them are actually uh, unicellular algae, and then you have multicellular algae. Mosses are kind of primitive plants. Then you have ferns which are the first vascular plants, but still a little bit primitive. And then you have the seed plants, uh, which are these two guys. And uh, that includes the ones with the naked seeds, the gymnosperms, and the ones with the covered seeds, the angiosperms. And within the angiosperms, uh, the flowering plants, there are the monocots and the dicots. A typical monocot would be a grass or this uh, narcissus, a daffodil. Um, and dicots are, for instance, beans or sunflowers. So the flowering plants, and they have been in evolution very successful. There are t many, many different species. They are studied the most. We know most about them. So um, most of what I'm going to show you was from research on flowering plants. So that's the origin of plants. Um, now if we zoom in a little bit again, uh, plants are made up of cells, uh, as all organisms are. The size of a cell of a eukaryote is about 100 micrometer, which is t a tenth of a millimeter about the tenth of the, a pinhead, you can, if you have real good eyes, you might see a cell. But um, it's, it's, you see much more with a light microscope. And then you would see something like this, maybe. <laughs> with an electron microscope, you can actually really see something like this. You can really see all the little structures in the cell. So um, we're going to have a look at what's in these cells in a little bit. I just wanted to uh, note a couple of things that makes plants special and different from uh, other multicellular eukaryotes. One is they're totipotent, which means they can do everything. And uh, what that means is uh, you have all these different cells with specialized functions, but that doesn't mean that that's all they will ever be able to do. So you can coax a leaf cell back into an entire plant with all the different cell types if you just give it the right hormones. And that's what people in horticulture do all the time. So you can grow plants on artificial medium. You can put some different hormones in there. And you can have tissue culture where you take any cell from a plant. It can be a flower cell. And you can grow it back into an entire plant. And that can be very useful, very applicable. The fact that these plants are totipotent. You can manipulate them with hormones. And another thing that is special about plants um, and different from other uh, eukaryotes is that they have connected cells. You see that here. These are three neighboring cells. And the inside of each cell is connected via little connections called plasmodesmata uh, with the neighboring cell. So if you're a molecule, you can travel from cell to cell through the entire organ, like through the entire leaf. So that's, it has implications for transport of molecules within the plant. It also may have implications for plant pathology, because if you have a virus in a <coughs> leaf, it can also travel via these channels. And the, to, if you connect all the area within the cells, you see here these blue uh, lines. Those are the membranes around the cell. So everything within the blue lines is called the symplast. That is a term that plant physiologists use a lot. It's a symplast. If something is in the symplast, it's inside the cells, and it can travel within the plant. And if the area outside the symplast, so that would be this brown compartment, the cell wall, that is called the apoplast. 
So if things are in the plant, you could say, is it in the symplast or in the apoplast? If something travels, is it traveling in the symplast or in the apoplast? And those two compartments are separated by a membrane. So this blue thing here is the membrane, the cell membrane. Every compartment of a cell is surrounded by one or more of these membranes. You see them here as black lines. So the whole cell is surrounded by this membrane. And also, all the compartments within the cell are surrounded by one or more of these same membranes. Membranes are very good at separating aqueous compartments, so watery solutions. Do you see what a membrane molecule looks like, typically? It has a hydrophilic head and two hydrophobic legs or uh, tails. That's what you see here. So this kind of orange thing is the head, it's hydrophilic, so it likes water, it's, it has charged groups in there, and then the hydrophobic tails are hydrocarbons. And what happens if you take a bunch of these molecules, these what are called phospholipid molecules, and you throw them in water, is that they will spontaneously form a bilayer. And that's what you see here, and that's a membrane, it's a bilayer of these phospholipid molecules. The hydrophobic tails naturally seek each other out because they like to be in a hydrophobic environment. And the hydrophilic heads move to the outside of the membrane because that's where the aqueous liquids are. There is, that's where the cell fluid is, which is basically a water solution, and also the environment, so if the plant is in the soil or the, there's always water in the cell wall. So um, we have a watery solution on both sides of the membrane, and then we have an interior of the membrane that is hydrophobic. It's like oil, or it's very greasy. And that is very effective separation. That's why the membrane is, is very effective separation. If you're a, a water-soluble molecule and you're, you're on one side of the membrane, you just cannot pass through this oily interior. You're not going to go there. Uh, still, there has to be transport, because things have to get through those membranes, traffic. And that's why all these membranes have proteins embedded in them. And that's what you see as these big blobs. About half of every membrane consists of proteins. Half of the mass of the membrane is protein. And they often have transport functions. And they have very specific transport functions. As you will see later in um, one of the modules, I think it's five or six. So we're going to have a look at what kind of membrane transporters there are and um, kind of how they work and which ones are really important. So that's the idea of... Um, cells, compartments, how they're separated, and how traffic is made possible. In addition to transport proteins, there are also proteins that function as enzymes, and enzymes are proteins that speed up biochemical reactions. So they make something happen, a certain reaction. And there are also proteins in membranes that function in signal transduction. And what that means is um, they are often receptors. They're sitting there waiting for a signal to come by, like a hormone. When that binds to the receptor, this leads to a response in the cell. So when the receptor sees the molecule that it binds to, then it will tell the cell, hey, the molecule's here, and then you will get a response. So the molecule could be um, a warning, an alarm signal, because the plant is being attacked somewhere, and then this hormone starts to circulate through the plant. It's perceived by a protein in the membrane. And then the cell is going to start making defense compounds, like a toxic product that's going to attack the attacker. So that's an example of signal perception and transduction. And in section three, we're going to have a look at which hormones there are and um, how signal transduction generally works. So how it goes from signal being perceived to a useful response happening in the cell. Any questions about membranes? And hopefully you remember that proteins are made up of amino acids. There are 20 different amino acids in proteins. And proteins are encoded by genes, so they're in the DNA. So we're going to have a look at um, these different organelles now. And the DNA is located right here in the nucleus. Nucleus, this purple organelle. It is the nerve center of the cell. It controls everything that happens in the cell. It has the DNA, which tells the cell how to build the plant, but also it's constantly responding to the environment. So 
we have all these genes which are part of the DNA, and there may be, let's say, 30,000 genes, but at any given time, a cell may make only five or 10,000 of the proteins encoded by those genes. The other ones it doesn't need, because maybe it's a root cell. It doesn't need photosynthetic proteins. There's no light in the roots. So it has the genes, all the genes are the same in all the cells, but it, not every gene is expressed. That's the term for the gene is on and the protein is made. So all the genes are everywhere, but uh, every cell has to make a decision all the time. Which proteins am I actually going to make? Which ones do I need? And um, you can also imagine if, as long as the plant is not attacked, it's not going to make defense compounds. So those genes involved in making them are shut off until the plant is attacked. So there are all these eventualities. The plants have all kinds of genes that they may never need, but if they need them, they have them, and then they, sh they turn them on. So those decisions are all the, way, all the time made here in the nucleus. So, so the DNA is here. Um, in eukaryotes, the DNA is arranged in the form of chromosomes. There are a number of linear molecules of DNA called chromosomes. And every uh, organism has, or every species, has a characteristic number of chromosomes. So plants may have, for instance, 24 chromosomes. And they are um, hanging out here in the nucleus. When the cell is going to divide, these chromosomes condense, and then they become really thick and short, and you can see them under a microscope. When the cell is not dividing, then they're just spread out, all the DNA is spread out, unwound, and then all the DNA can be easily um, used, expressed to make proteins. But when it's all curled up, you cannot do that. That's just for uh, replication. Um, so if a gene is expressed, then uh, the that gene, that piece of DNA, is transcribed into a messenger RNA. So a copy is made of another nucleic acid. And that then um, leaves, that, that mRNA leaves the nucleus, and it goes to a place where that RNA will be translated into protein. And that happens on the ribosomes. And you see here this structure around the nucleus. It's called the ER, endoplasmic reticulum. And that's where you see all those black dots, the, the ribosomes, which make the proteins. So when RNA is transcribed in the nucleus, it goes out of the nucleus by means of these pores, nuclear pores, through the nuclear envelope, which is actually a double membrane. So it's two bilayers with holes in them called nuclear pores for trafficking, and that's where the mRNA would go out. And it would find a ribosome. Here you see the ribosome as a red dot, and that's the place where the RNA is going to be recognized, and then it's going to be translated into a protein. And that protein is the actual worker of the cell that's going to make something happen. So it may become a transporter or an enzyme or a signal um, perception or whatever. All many, many different functions. Thousands of different workers, each doing their different jobs in the cell. So the ER is actually continuous with the envelope of the nucleus. You see, if you're in between in the envelope, so in between the two bilayer membranes, you could travel from this envelope of the nucleus right into the ER. And then all these vesicles, all these sacs of the ER are connected. So they're one big maze through which molecules can travel. And this is the beginning of what's called the endomembrane system. So it's a system of membranes within the cell. Endo means within that is connected, and it's, it's, it functions kind of like a big assembly line. What does the assembly line make? Proteins and lipids. I already mentioned proteins are made on these ribosomes, and they will continue on their way through the en endomembrane system to their final destination, but also lipids are made in there, and they will also proceed through the endomembrane system to their final destination where they function. So this is a big... Uh, factory, you could say, the endomembrane system. So it all starts uh, with the nuclear envelope and the surrounding ER, endoplasmic reticulum. And ER actually has two um, parts to it, which is called the rough ER and the smooth ER, based on what it looks like with under the electron microscope. The rough ER looks rough because it is studded with these ribosomes. The smooth ER doesn't have those ribosomes. and um, that reflects the function. The rough ER makes more proteins, smooth ER makes more uh, lipids. So it doesn't have all these ribosomes because they make the proteins. But they're part of the same system. 
And you see also here that the smooth ER is a little more tubular for, and the rough ER is a little more flat, more like pita bread, uh, kind of. And everything is continuous. <coughs> If you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. Can you still hear me well in the back? Yeah, okay. This is a close-up with an electron microscope of a stack of ER membranes, rough ER. And the ER membrane is actually the darker part, so the, the line, if you will. And you see that on the line you have all those dots, those circles, those are the ribosomes. And the, these ribosomes are actually temporarily attached to the ER as they're making a protein. So only if they're making a protein are they attached to the ER. If they're not making the pro a protein, they detach and they hang out until a new messenger RNA comes along. They bind it and then they go to the ER and then they start translating that uh, message, message into a protein. So all these guys are busy. These are like operators on the phone. <laughs> these guys are making protein. These guys are hanging out. They're free ribosomes and free ribosomes uh, may either just be waiting, hanging out, waiting for an mRNA to come by, but uh, some mRNAs actually are translated right there in the cytosol. But this is the name of the kind of the liquid of the, s the chunky soup that is the cell uh, content. The organelles are the chunks in the soup. Then the liquid is the cytosol. The cytosol is just kind of the basis, the matrix of the liquid of the cell. So um, here we have the ER. This is the cytosol. There are ribosomes attached to the ER. I should point here. There are ribosomes attached to the ER. They're dumping their proteins that they're synthesizing into the ER. And then there are ribosomes hanging out in the cytosol. They may be doing nothing, or they may also be making proteins, and then they dump them right there in the cytosol. And some proteins uh, just function in the cytosol. So there's no point for them going into the ER if they need to be in the cytosol. Then they're produced in the cytosol. And there are also a couple of organelles that also get their proteins straight from the cytosol, so that doesn't go through this whole endomembrane system. And I'll point them out as, as we go along. The inside of the ER is also called the ER lumen. Lumen means the inside, the interior. There's also the lumen of the envelope of the nucleus. There are also lumen compartments in other organelles, as you will see later. The lumen means inside. Here you can, uh, gives you an idea how to envision a protein being made on a ribosome, on the ER. And you see two pictures, one of them I drew and the other one is from the book, so the book is much better. But um, basically, so this is a ribosome, this is the ER. The interior, the lumen is right here. So a message, an uh, mRNA molecule uh, is brought to the ER membrane by the ribosome. And then here you see the protein being made, and as it's being made, it is released into the lumen of the ER, and then it proceeds on its way. You will see later where it goes, but that's where it starts. That's where a protein is being born. And here you see the same thing, uh, but here we see at the bottom, we see the messenger RNA as this green line. It's made up of nucleotides, if you remember, like DNA is made of nucleotides. And if you remember, three nucleotides encode for one amino acid. Remember that? So, um, so the ribosome recognizes the messenger RNA, it binds to it, and then it starts to read these nucleotides. And then for every three nucleotides, it adds a specific amino acid to the growing polypeptide chain. The protein is a polypeptide. So you see the protein growing here. Look it looks kind of like a necklace. It's t 20 different color beads, the different amino acids. And then at some point, the protein is ready and then it is released from the ribosome and it goes on its way. And as you see here, here gives you a glimpse of what is going to happen to that protein. It's going to be captured in a vesicle. Vesicle is like a little pinch of the membrane that is pinched off, like a water droplet that you pinch off of a larger pool of water, just a little pinch off and then you have a little droplet. Or if you have uh, water coming, dripping from a tap, drip, 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 then you see the droplet release is released. It falls as a little sphere, and then it may fuse with a puddle that's already down there. So droplets of water can be 
to be pinched off from a larger water body, and then they can fuse with another water body somewhere else. And it's the same thing with these membrane vesicles, as they're called. They're little spheres enclosed by a bilayer, a membrane, and they can travel through the cell. And they can be pinched off of one membrane, and they can fuse to another membrane. And they can hold the cargo. So in this case, the cargo can be proteins, or they can also be lipids. But if they're lipids, then they're, they're not really inside the vesicle, then they're more part of the whole oily vesicle. So the ER makes proteins, and it makes lipids. Rough ER are more proteins. Smooth ER are more lipids. And then it packs them in these little vesicles, which basically just pinch off of the ER membrane. And um, it, before it sends them on their way in these vesicles, it may modify them. So some proteins may have some groups added onto them, which are later needed for the function of these proteins. For instance, sugar groups may be added. So there's enzymes uh, in the ER that can modify molecules. And then uh, these vesicles that pinch off of the ER start to travel, and then they're going to the next component of the endomembrane system, and it's called the Golgi apparatus, after Mr. Golgi in Italy, who first saw it under the light microscope. He had very good eyes, because most people cannot see it. It's so small. So a vesicle is like a little sphere, a little droplet, it has a membrane all around it, and it has a little watery compartment in the center that can hold a cargo, like proteins. And it can travel. And actually, as you will see later, uh, it doesn't just diffuse randomly, but there are proteins that can actually move these vesicles. So they can bind them, and they can then move their highways in the cell, which you will see too. So these proteins walk along the highways, and they take these vesicles along, and they can bring them from A to B. So something like this, you have the ER here on the left, um, a, a protein, let's say this green thing is a protein, it gets pinched off, piece of the membrane pinches off, and then it travels uh, as a vesicle through the cytosol, and then that same vesicle can fuse to another membrane, so here it's fusing in the process of fusing, and then you see that the contents of the vesicle now ha is at the other end other side of the membrane. So it's a means of membrane transport. Our protein uh, moves from the interior of the ER, if this is the ER, and if this is the Golgi apparatus, you see that our protein passed two membranes. Technically, if you look, it passed this membrane, it passed this membrane, but it never had to actually physically go through the phospholipid bilayer. It was just a trick by a piece of that membrane pinching off and fusing again on the other side. It's a very effective, uh, energetically favorable way to get things across membranes because it's hard to get big molecules across membranes. It's possible. Proteins can also physically go through a membrane, as you will see later, but this is a very efficient way to do it also. So cells like to make use of this way. So what does the Golgi looks like? look like? Um, it looks like a stack of pita breads, as you see here on the left, and here you see an electron micrograph. And it has a receiving end and a shipping end. So it's like a factory. So we have shipping and receiving. So receiving brings in raw ingredients. Shipping sends out the finished product. So they don't start from scratch. The ER starts from scratch. So it really starts to make a protein out of amino acids. But the Golgi gets kind of semi-finished proteins and lipids in, it modifies them, finishes them, ship, wraps them, and ships them to their final destination. So it's coming in in vesicles, and they're leaving in vesicles. It's coming in from the ER, and it's going to either the cell membrane, or it can go to uh, the vacuole, which is another organelle, or it can go to a, um, it can go to the cell wall, so it can go through the membrane, out of the cell. Those are all possible destinations. So that's still all part of the endomembrane system. So we have shipping end, receiving end. Um, at receiving end, vesicles come in, and then um, there are some modifications. Groups are added, and, uh, and then when it's done, it's shipped in the form of vesicles again from the shipping end. 
So groups that can be added uh, can be sugar groups, and the term for adding sugar groups is glycosylation. So glyco, that is generally used for to denote sugar. So glycosylation, you add a sugar group. And those sugar groups may be needed if, for, for instance, our protein is going to be a receptor protein that's sitting in the cell membrane, then those sugar groups often are sticking out, and that may have a function in the receptor, um, the reception of the sensing of the signal. Um, sometimes also sugar groups can have an address label function that tells the uh, cell where this protein needs to go. So they may tell it, uh, this protein needs to go to the vacuole just by where the sugars are added. Phosphate groups is another kind of group that is added and that can have um, functions, uh, can be needed for the function of the protein. So somewhere in that stack of pita breads, there are enzymes that add these sugars and that add these phosphates. And then when the protein is ready, then by that time it has arrived at the shipping end. It's, it's wrapped in the form of a vesicle again, which pinches off, and then it goes on its way to the final destination. So it can be the plasma membrane. It can be go through the plasma membrane and end up in the cell wall. So that's in the apoplast. Remember the apoplast? So it's outside of the plasma, the, the symplast, so it's cell wall. Or it can go to the vacuole. So that brings me to the vacuole. Vacuole is a very big compartment, important compartment in plants. It can be 90 or 95 percent of the cell volume. So it can be gigantic. And it functions in um, sturdiness, which is a little bit maybe strange to think of, but it's kind of like a big balloon that can be blown up by water pressure, filling it with water. And that gives the cell a lot of sturdiness in the whole plant sturdiness. And you see that if you forget to water your plants and if they become all limp, wilted, that is because the water has gone out of the vacuole and now the whole plant becomes limp um, or flaccid if, yeah. Yes. So if the, if, if the uh, vacuole is full of water, we, we say that there's a lot of turgor. The, the plant is turgid. And if the plant is not turgid, then it is flaccid. Is it flaccid? Flaccid, OK. So that means it's wilted. It's not turgid. So that's all a function of water pressure. And we're going to have a look at turgor pressure and how plants can actually regulate the, their water status, how they can respond to drying conditions, for instance, so that they can maintain turgor pressure, because that's very important for the plant. They need this turgor pressure to function, uh, because if they want to open their uh, stomata, their holes in their leaves, so that they can uh, have gas exchange and they can get CO2 in to make sugars and grow, uh, they need water to, to do that. So it's very important. Um, so sturdiness is a function. Then there is um, storage. So if it's 90 percent of the cell volume, if you want to store something, the vacuole is a good idea. Ions like uh, potassium or um, sugars, um, acids, pigments, toxins. So those have ecological functions often if they want to attract pollinators or seed dispersers or uh, toxins if they don't want to be eaten, then they often store their uh, toxic stuff in the vacuole. And another function of the vacuole is that breakdown of waste products, recycling, happens often in the vacuole. So it's kind of like a lysosome function in animal cells. Uh, there are in the vacuole you have those same kinds of enzymes that do recycling. So if, if a protein is old and not functioning anymore, it goes to the vacuole. It's broken down. Amino acids are recycled. Plants don't have kidneys. They don't excrete things. So they have to try to recycle everything they can. The plant says, away. There is no away. I have to recycle. So that's the vacuole. And the membrane around the vacuole is called the tonoplast. So it has a special name. Because it is important in plant water relations often. Okay, so I think we have two minutes left. I'm going to leave it at this. If you have any questions, then I'll be happy to answer them. And see you next time.